The following content has been provided by RWTH Aachen University. All right, folks. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to GIS One. Um, again, thank you for uh, uh, wearing masks in here so that we can keep everybody as healthy as possible. Today, uh, we're going to first do a very quick review of what we talked about last time, and then we're going to jump into a couple of additional models that help us understand how people interact with technology. And there's going to be a bunch of little in-class exercises that you might have to do with um, you know, your neighbor. So make sure that you may have somebody uh, sitting reasonably next to you so that you can uh, work on that problem together. First of all, a quick review. So we took a look at HCI as a research field. And we had four big areas. Anybody remember any of those four areas? This is where you need to get your brain turned on and all that kind of stuff. I know it's tough in the morning. Go ahead. I think one was the human, one was the computer, one was like, uh, <laughs> uh, like the other thing. Okay. Good, good call. She, she caught the two easy ones, right? You know, humans and computers are part of HCI. Good one. Uh, but that's correct. Uh, what were the other two? Anybody remember? And it's perfectly normal not to have these at the, you know, the front of your mind because they're not that obvious that you need to think about them too. Yeah, go ahead. Um, psychology and design are really other disciplines that, that you're absolutely right. You know, HCI is at the crossroads of computer science, psychology, and design. So yes, um, but. You know, we are looking at psychological questions when we talk about like the human being part of what we, what we study in HCI. Um, anybody else want to take a shot? Yeah. Uh, the input system, I'd say. So how we interact with the computer and maybe how it's displayed to us. So for example, like augmented reality glasses and stuff. So that would be the technology part of it, uh, that is at the, you know, at, at the fringe of the computer, right? We understand like all the technology that we have that the human interacts with is in there. And that was right in the middle of that HCI graphic that you may remember that shows the discipline. Um, all right, so the other two things that are missing are one, the whole design process where you think about how do I actually get from an idea about a product to, a, to an actual prototype to a finished uh, product. That was at the bottom of that graph, and then at the top was the social context. Right? Interaction is never, even though we love to think about it like this, it never happens in isolation. Right? You're never in a black bubble and just interacting with the computer. There's always stuff going on around you, and that has an impact on the interaction. And the interaction has an impact on what's going on around you. So uh, those are the four areas. Now, uh, we talked about the CMN model next, like the uh, uh, cart morin newell model, the model human processor, it's also called. The, the bubbly head guy, remember the graph of that? Okay, yeah, bubbly head, everybody's like, yes, I remember that. Um, so what are the main components of that model? What is the engineering model saying what our brain consists of? You know, it's a very simplified model, of course, uh, just has a few components in there. Um, and what are those? Yeah. Mm -hmm. terms, so, so a perceptual processor, yeah. Mm -hmm. Then uh, the memory. Mm -hmm. So there was memories associated. Actually, with each processor, sort of like both the visual one or the perceptual one and the other processor up there. And uh, the motor propeller. Yeah, so the motor processor. So good thing to remember is three processors, right? Perception, cognition, motor. And that's easy to remember if you just think about like seeing something thinking about the reaction, doing the reaction. Uh, you've got those three processors, and there's memory associated with them. Uh, Long-term and short-term memory, uh, working memory, we also call it, uh, and different storage uh, types were also part of the CMN model. So, and then there were a few key numbers that the CMN model is actually giving us. Um, so what are those numbers about? Uh, the perception point is about 100 milliseconds. Right. Uh, and um, then there's uh, the loop, like an open loop for uh, a motor processor. It's like 70 milliseconds. Mm -hmm. And a closed loop is about 240 for the average person. Yep, that's right. 
So those are the those are the uh, per, you know the the cycle times of the processor: 100 milliseconds perception, uh, 70 milliseconds, as you said, the motor system open loop, and there's another 70 milliseconds for the cognitive processor to basically retrieve one, you know, kind of like if this then that kind of mapping, like right? you know, making one decision or or executing a simple rule. If what you need to do in response to a, a stimulus is more complex, then time will um, you know, get longer appropriately. Um, all right, and then the other thing that we had out of the CNN model was actually uh, another set of numbers, yeah. Yeah, the segments of the clock uh, term memory. Mm -hmm. So we have the aggregate of seven seconds for four plus minus one volts, mm -hmm. and we have both numbers. Right, right. Um, so that was the capacity of short-term memory, seven plus or minus one is the classic number, and more recent research seems to suggest that it's even more closer to four plus or minus uh, one, yes. Uh, anything else? Yeah, so, so there were actually also uh, um, like decay times, right? You know, the, the likelihood when you, how long you will remember something. Uh, those are also in there and they, they tend to differ between different modalities and they also differ between extremely between long-term memory and, uh, and working memory, of course. Right? Working memory gets erased after a few seconds. Remember, you re we're reading numbers to each other, right? And that was testing that capacity and, and how long you could hold on to stuff. Whereas long-term memory, if you really learn something actively, theoretically stays in there forever. All right, next up we talked about Fitt's Law, right? You ruined your pencil tips uh, for the science. So uh, what was the message from Fitt's Law? What is it actually telling us? Okay. That the time we need to press a button depends on the distance of the button and the width of the button. There's a lot of rhythmic dependency. Yes, so time to press something depends on distance and width of the target, and uh, there is a log in there somewhere uh, that is telling us how to, um, how to map these things to each other. Um, right, so uh, there were a couple more things in there, of course, you know, there's more details to Fitz Law, there's an index of difficulty and an index of, uh, uh, of movement, and these two numbers are basically you know, factorized together to get to the final times. Uh, there were different versions of it, you know, Welford and the Shannon formulation that got closer and closer to actually really predicting things. And this, that's an important one. All right, so today uh, I want to jump in by just giving you a big message that is going to be also what you will see when you read the, the, the book by Don Norman, but it also explains why we read that book. Uh, the, one of the big messages that I'm trying to get across in this class is that user errors are really design errors. Right? So what that means is that uh, we as designers or developers tend to blame users for mistakes. You know, there is the famous DAO, the dümmste anzunehmende user, uh, that people like to you know, joke about. And that is unfortunately a misconception. When people make a mistake with software, you can essentially always find out what went wrong in the software and you can find that there may have been some design mistake that led to this, mis this, this error. Because people don't make mistakes intentionally, right? They usually uh, end up just making a mistake because something in the software suggested to them that was the right thing to do. So we tend to blame users for mistakes. Users tend to blame themselves for mistakes. Uh, but usually it's actually the product designer or the user interface designer uh, that is to blame because you know, the work wasn't done carefully enough to find out how the user interface should actually work. And, um, this is, I always talk about you know, user interface and you, you think about computers, of course, in that, that sense, or you know, your smartphone or whatever. But um, actually, computers are nothing special in that regard. Um, we have a lot of things around us, everyday things, um, and that have many of the same problems, actually. Right? They also have issues that lead to bad usability. And so the point here is that this is why, we're why Norman takes this look at everyday things, right? There's a lot to be learned about how people interact with technology just by looking at how they interact with everyday things like a door, for example, right? And so this is why the work of Norman has this everyday things approach. Um, a lot of things you've discovered in there will directly transfer to understanding why mistakes happen on computers and how to best design interfaces for computers. But the computer, of course, adds another layer of complexity because it's so flexible. It can be anything. Right? Your smartphone can run any kind of app at any time. It you know, really you know, transforms itself from one thing to the other. And that means that
that computers have extra potential for people making mistakes. Right? Uh, if you have a, you know, if you have something that doesn't change, this pen, I can, I know, like, you know, until the end of the existence of this pen, it will always work this way. That I pull off the cap and put it back on, and this is how the pen works. It doesn't change. But my smartphone, and one app running on it. I start another app, everything is completely different, right? So it's very flexible, which is great. It's the power of computers, um, but it also is sort of the problem with computers because there is a, it's much harder to get used to how they work and to really become competent uh, in using them because they tend to change under our hands. So user errors are design errors. This is an important message to keep in mind. Now, uh, this is where you need to take out a, uh, you know, a piece of paper and a pen. Um, and together with whoever's sitting next to you, I would like you to just spend, you know, five minutes, really short, to design a universal remote for radio, TV, and DVD. So it's supposed to be one device that controls, you know, that lets me control all three of these. Um, talk to your neighbor about how you want to make this work, and uh, we'll get back to this design later. This is it? So. You now have, a, you now have a, a, an early first design sketch out there, right? So hold on to this. And what we're going to do now is we're going to go over a couple of basic rules of interface design, um, some you know, psychological fundamentals. And I would like you to, as we go through each of these, you know, take a peek at your, at your design, keep your design in mind, and think about, hmm, I guess I could apply this to improve the design. Or, oh, that's where I sort of ignored that rule because I didn't know about it. And, and that would probably, or could make the usability worse than it has to be. Um, so this is the idea of this, right? We're not going to you know, share all of our designs with everybody. It's just something for you to hold on to as, you know, this is what you would you know, intuitively design yourself. And now we want to see whether the laws that we talk about can improve that baseline. All right, that's the idea. OK, uh, we also used, you know, like really old school physical stuff here, right? You're not, not um, whatever, um, Spotify or something, because this is something that actually makes it easy to point out these, uh, these interface issues. Now, let's move on. We're going to first talk about uh, what's known as Gestalt law. So this will start with an exercise. Um, who can see, if, just raise your hand, if you can see anything, any object, anything in this image. OK, that's about, I'd say, 70% or so. Um, what are you seeing? Uh, a door, so like a Dalmatian. Uh-huh. Right, there's a, there's a Dalmatian dog. And, and then, you know, if you really push it, there might be a tree back there that he's like sniffing his way towards. Um, Who's not seeing the dog? Can you raise your hand? OK, this punch. I'm going to show it to you now. All right, so, or like illustrate where it is. Um, you know, there's a head up there, and then there's two front legs, and, and the hind legs are kind of hidden behind each other. So now that you've seen it, if I take this away, uh, you can probably still see it. In fact, it's really hard to unsee it at this point, right? It's really hard to not see the dog in the image. So what I'm trying to show you with this simple exercise is that our brains are real, our brains are pretty amazing. They're really wired to perceive things and to make sense of what we perceive, right? To really make sense of what we give them. Because this is just, you know, a black and white uh, spotty image. And the brain goes in like, oh, there's got to be something there. Come on, there's got to be something there. And then it finds something that's like, oh, that looks like a pattern that I know. So it's trying to make sense of what's around us. This is how we are. Uh, that's how we are wired. That's biology, right? A um, couple more of those. See anything? Raise your hand. Yeah, this one I think is a little easier, right? There's a, there's a guy on a, on a, on a horse there. Uh, this one is a, is a famous one. Um, some people see a vase, right? Um, other people see two faces facing each other. Um, and once you've seen the one version, it's kind of actually hard to flip to the other one, right? You, um, and uh, there's another. A famous illusion. Uh, I'm sure many of you have seen this one. Uh, who sees an old woman in this one? All right. Who sees a young woman in this one? All right. It's like half and half. And if you really try, you can actually make yourself flip this image from one to the other. But it, you actually need to co consciously push yourself to do that, right? Uh, and then here's the FSK 18 version of this. Uh, 
Who sees dolphins in this image? Oh, that's so cute. Thank you. Somebody is seeing dolphins. Thank you. So technically, there are both things in there, right? Um, and uh, again, it's really hard to switch between these things once your brain has latched onto one interpretation of this, OK? All right, so where is this coming from? Um, in the 1930s, so this is almost 100 years ago, a bunch of psychologists got together and thought, geez, uh, sorry, 1912, that this is over 100 years ago at this point. Um, they got together and asked themselves, hmm, uh, what is it that makes humans perceive things as a group? It's a very simple question. How do we group the, if you like, the pixels, you know, the photons hitting our retina? How do we group that stuff? How does the brain order this thing into groups that, that somehow seem to belong together? Mostly spatially, but they also thought about this temporally. So things that happen after each other over, over time, how do we group those kinds of events into into sections. Um, and they found over 100 what they called Gestalt laws. And these laws essentially govern pretty much everything we do with our environment, actually. right? They, they govern how we perceive the things around us. They govern how we move ourselves, um, how our memory stores things, how we think and learn uh, uh, things, and how we act. So um, if you just look around in this room here, you might say, well, it's, it's all just pixels. But immediately, you, you know, look at the wall, and you see the, you know, the top uh, beam there, the dark gray one. And there is a, watt, you know, a clock behind, beneath this. So your brain automatically groups these things and figures out what are the objects right, in this room, rather than just getting um, an overload of, of you know, brightness values, basically. And this is, why is this interesting for us? Because this is one of the. Uh, most important section or, or group of rules that actually also govern how we perceive user interfaces. Right? You look at this, and your brain, before you even know it, has already determined that there is two things behind, be, behind each other. Right? How is it doing that? Well, there are, I'm going to talk about the laws that make that happen. But you, know, you see that this is obviously one part that seems to belong together. And then there's another one that you expect to extend like this. Um, but you know you definitely distinguish the two from each other. And inside that, you also have, you know, you have a title, and then there's a section here, and there's another section here, and another section here. And a lot of visual cues um, are giving you these hints in like how, uh, how to basically parse this interface and section it off into groups. Now, here's an important thing to understand about Gestalt laws. Gestalt laws aren't good or bad. They just are. It's like you know, gravity. It, it's a thing. So Gestalt laws will happen. You know, they will govern how users perceive the interface that you design, no matter what. Your choice as a designer is whether you know these laws and use them to your advantage to make it easier to use an interface, or whether you ignore them or even actually you know, consciously break them, which will make an interface harder to use. Because when you build them an interface and you don't know about these laws, uh, you know, the Gestalt laws are going to take effect because you can't avoid them, just like gravity. And then they will lead to the user perceiving the interface different from what you intended them to see. But if you use the Gestalt laws, then you can actually guide the user towards the right way to interpret the interface, the way that you intended it to be, and that makes it easiest to use. So this is basically what Gestalt laws are. Uh, we're going to start with another in-class exercise here. Uh, you will need some paper, and it's going to start at the very last row. Okay? So, I want um, the very last row there. You guys, take out a, an empty sheet of paper and a pen. Um, and I will, I will need a, a piece of paper and a pen, too. Thank you. Awesome. I'm seeing some great examples here. OK, uh, now uh, I'm going to show you the original image that I, that I did. OK, I'm going to show that to everybody now. It's this. OK? <laughs> So can we see some of the examples from the front row? Uh, can you hold those up? Yeah. <laughs> so as you can tell, something happened here, right? I, I like Laura's here, for example. This is a great example, because what it did is it's not like a super simple shape. But what you can see is it got, re it got sort of uh, changed into something that is actually easier to describe, right? This is 
actually a pretty complex shape to describe precisely, uh, unless you call it, you know, an unshapely blob. But, but this actually is fairly, fairly regular, right? This actually has a fairly regular shape, and it's, it's, it's like, a, you know, a torn off ticket or something. So there, again, is your brain, you know, as we did this over several rounds of interpretation here, uh, there's your brain trying to make sense of it. This is another good example. We almost always get, you know, the, uh, the pumpkin, basically, we call it like this, okay? which is, it's down to a regular shape with one weird thing, right? It's a, it's a, it's a circle with, with an extension. Uh, we actually have another one here of those. We have several, uh, several pumpkins. So and one more complex. Yeah, <laughs> and I don't know how that happened. So, um, so you guys, uh, there's actually excellent therapists in Aachen, so. Um, <laughs> all right, good, thank you very much. Um, what I'm illustrating with this is that your brain actually is running what I would like to call, um, oh, here's, here's some more examples, like you know, the, what, we, what we often see in these, in these things, right? just to show you, this is from other, other classes, right? Stuff gets reduced and gets even more pronounced in its shapes, right? So we call this law uh, the law of good shape. So your perception has a tendency towards remembering um, things as good or clear or simple shapes, right? You know, the psychologists back then called it good shape. You can think of it as, you know, simplified or, or less data, right? You know, easier to remember. Um, when I think about this law, I think about it as almost like a cognitive compression algorithm, right? There is your brain, and, and it gets this complex impression, and, and your brain is kind of lazy. It's like, oh man, this is complex. You know, this is complicated. Let me simplify that a bit by, you know, making some things more pronounced and other things I'm just going to ignore. And, and so this is going on all the time. Now, what does that mean for your uh, for interface design? It means if an interface has a very complex, you know, layout, very very irregular. Uh, shapes and, and, and designs, it's going to be a lot of information for the brain to take in. And the brain is going to simplify. It's, it's going to ignore little things, right? So it might overlook that little button that you put in the corner because there was so much else going on. Right? If, on the other hand, you manage to clean up your UI a bit and have it look simpler and be simpler and, and quicker to perceive and parse and, and put into categories, it's going to be preserved more uh, reliably, right? Your brain, the brain is going to remember it uh, more easily. Um, so in, in fact, and this is me really going out on a limb here, but um, you may have heard about people who have eidetic memory, right? Who can uh, actually, you know, if you showed them this, they would redraw it exactly like that. And, and the problem that these people have is that they, in a way, do not have these filters that help them reduce the multitude of information coming in into simple things to remember, right? So um, that's the first one. That's the law of good shape. We're going to do another one here. Um, if you had to tell me to draw this, uh, how would you describe what I need to draw? Like uh, a couple of uh, lines shaped like a pillar. Uh huh. Shaped like lovely. Uh, a couple of lines shaped like a pillar. So. This basically means that you've, you've interpreted what you see, and you've also kind of grouped these two together into one thing and these two together, right? Very natural. Everybody does this. Um, but why are we doing this? Well, what's, what's happening, what's governing your perception at this point is the law of proximity, right? So uh, it's a very simple one and very obvious one. The brain tends to put objects that are near each other into a group. Um, very few people would have said, so there's a, a line, and then there's two other lines that are really far apart, and then there's another line. And nobody would do it that way. Everybody would group the left two ones together and the right two ones. And you've actually gone another step. You've basically uh, almost interpreted it as, a, as an image, right, to, uh, putting it um, even further together. So the advantage of uh, this, uh, this law of proximity is that it allows you to group things just by where you put them. You don't need anything else. You don't need any extra boxes around. You don't need color. You don't need different sizes or shapes. All you need is positioning, right? So by just thinking carefully about the positioning of the UI elements on you know, your remote control, for example, you can already help the user understand which buttons belong together, right? Um, so it helps you to keep your interface simple. 
Um, an example of that, everybody's seen this, when you have a toolbar these days, right, on your desktop, you can draw in, you know, drag in some tools, and there's always a little separator, right, that you can also drag in. That is actually very intentional because that is there so that you can make use of the law of proximity to group tools into sections that are, you know, belonging together. Um, so that's, that's actually a very uh, common law. Here's a wonderful example. If you've walked up to the Mensa um, um, a while ago, there was this, I'm not sure whether that's still up, but, you know, you know there's, the, there's the thing to test your, what's, what's on your card, on your Mensa card, right? Um, and then they had a sign to put onto that. But I guess they forgot the screws or something, I don't know. So they put it up here, right? So use this to test your card. I'm not sure that's a good idea. Right? But what's happening is, of course, your know, law of proximity says, oh, this sign must belong to this interactive element, right? Um, so that's not using the law to your advantage. But the law is still there, right? It always is active. Next up, um, I would like uh, you to describe to me what, what you would tell me to draw. Like, how, you give me drawing uh, instructions. Okay, three houses. Oh, that, that's very homely. I like that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you're also clearly seeing three, three things here, right? Even though, if you think about it, uh, it's actually kind of, you know, the lines that we saw before, but now we've actually, you know, we've, we've just connected them, right? We've put these extra lines in. And so if you see this, uh, oops, sorry. If you see this, then, you know, you probably, the law of proximity would kick in and you'd say, all right, you know, there's a line and then there's two lines and two lines and there's one line. But if we connect these things into um, these closed shapes, then you actually group it differently, right? So you said three houses, three squares, you know, anything like that. Um, so closure, this is the law of closure uh, that tells us that closed lines and, and closed uh, line segments appear as shapes to us. And, and thus as belonging together, right, as making up a single thing. And that is the whole foundation of, you know, the window metaphor on a desktop. Right? If you think about what we do when we put windows on a desktop and then put stuff into it in a user interface on, on, um, on a desktop, then we are literally just drawing boxes around it, and, and that already suggests that this is an object. Right? There's another law that we'll get to in a second uh, that actually um, deepens that effect. But you know, this is actually exactly the effect we're seeing here. And this also you know, helps us group. This is one section, and there's one section, there's one section, there's a big one, and there's one, and there's one. This is, what you, this is your brain you know, uh, working its way through this design using those, those laws. Um, here's the next one. Um, if you look at this, then you'll say, OK, so now there's three boxes, and there's dots in them, right? But the dots you probably say, well, there's three dots, and then there's five, and then there's another four. Um, you know, those dots, if you remove the boxes around them, uh, no longer have this grouping, right? In fact, you might see other groupings here because of the law of proximity, right? You might maybe say, I don't know, uh, this seems to be one part, and this seems to be another one because there's a bit of a gap here. You know, your brain is trying to, it's, it's ambivalent, right? It doesn't quite know how to parse it. But if we put these lines in, super clear, right? So super clear that these are three, and these are five, and these are four that are supposed to belong together. And that is the law of common region, right? Um, objects inside a bounded region or, or area um, appear as belonging together very strongly, um, whether, they are, whether there's a box around them or whether there is a colored background of a, a unique color behind them. This always is uh, at work. So this is also uh, a basic element of the window metaphor, right? Um, you know, putting a box around something helps you to group stuff. But there's a danger of overdoing that. I mean, we use it in our window systems all the time, of course, right? We draw boxes around things, and then the stuff inside it actually belongs together. Um, but here's an example um, uh, that is from a, from a book called GUI Bloopers. It's a wonderful book by Jeff Johnson. It has all these like terrible user interfaces in there, and you can have a good laugh at them and, until you get to that page where you're like, Oh crap, that's exactly what I did in the UI you know, the other day. Um, so it's a wonderful book. Uh, but this is an example of you know, too many boxes, right? So you can see here, there is the contact info has a box around it, and then the name has a box, and first and last have a box, and the address has these other boxes. And here it gets even worse, right? So this you might still say, that's okay, you know, that helps me parse things. 
although we could probably do with just the law of proximity here, right? A lot of things you can just do by leaving a little white space, you know, a little unused interface area on the screen and shape, you know, pushing things towards groups so that you don't have all these lines because the lines make things more complex. So if your eye is down here, for example, it's already having trouble deciding, well, which of these lines belongs to which subgroup, right? And here it gets just out of hand, right? Now we've got like three, four, um, you know, um, nested hierarchies here all trying to use this uh, common region effect and it doesn't work, right? Your, your, your eye just goes, um, you know, it can't parse this well. Okay. Um, next up. Uh, so why don't, uh, why don't you tell me what, what do I need to, what do I need to draw? Give me drawing instructions for if I don't see this. Triangles. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so that's, again, psychologically perfectly normal. You're good. Um, so th what, what this means is basically uh, that you have just grouped things uh, vertically, right? You've, you said you know, the, the three circles, the three triangles, squares, etc. cetera. Uh, even though our reading order tends to go horizontal, right? So very few people would say draw a triangle and a circle and a square and then draw another triangle, circle, and a square, and then another one, right? Why? Because say, things that look similar um, are things that we perceive as belonging together, right? That's the law of similarity. Different objects um, have higher information content, uh, so higher cognitive effort um, than things that are the same. And again, uh, similarity doesn't mean, that, that doesn't mean that your interface always, everything has to look the same, right? This is something you can use as a design uh, trick, right? You can make those things that you want to belong together look the same, but then you may have other things um, that you may want to stick out and you shape them differently or you color them differently. So um, th there's a wonderful story, I think it's in Norman's book too, uh, where you know, people who were operating a power plant had all these rows of buttons in front of them. It looked kind of like you know, the picture that I was showing you last time at the first lecture. Uh, and, you know, the buttons were like, turn on the lights in the hallway, turn on the lights in the main room, turn on the lights in the bathroom, initiate nuclear meltdown, right? So, and, and so they ended up, you know, gluing beer taps and stuff onto these things just to make these buttons really look different because they didn't want to press them by accident, right? Um, so the, the law of similarity just says um, stuff that looks similar will be perceived as a group and you can use that as something that you can you know, make certain things stick out that you want to be noticed especially or that you don't want to be grouped in with the rest uh, and otherwise um, if you have a group of things then you want to shape them similarly. So here's a bad example of uh, interface design for, for a variety of reasons. Um, you won't remember this, but there used to be news readers on the internet where you could read you know, like sort of news channels and they, they looked like this in a, in a very, very fundamental way. Um, and what I thought was exciting, this was around the times of, you know, when X Windows came out and uh, people were creating graphic user interfaces, but they didn't really know what they were doing. So um, here's your list of, of, of news, and, and, and that's reasonably okay. Um, but here's the, the, here are the buttons to, to operate this program, right? And there's a couple of interesting things here. Every button here is as long as necessary to put the text in. I'm sure the program was pretty you know, proud of that clever programming that every button would automatically scale to that size. But what it does is, of course, that um, it becomes pretty hard to parse, right? Also, all the buttons are at equal distance to each other. There's no grouping going on here, right? If there is any grouping, you might say, well, maybe, you know, first and second line, and maybe this one here that's on the line by itself is a grouping. But let me tell you something. If you actually resize that window, the buttons would rewrap, which of course, that, that's interface hell, right? That means like one day you make the window this wide and, and your new post button is over on the right and the next time you make it a little small and your new post button is suddenly somewhere else. Um, that is bound to mess up users, right? Um, so uh, this is a, an example of not using pretty much any of these laws we've talked about so far. Uh, and it makes for a bad interface design. Uh, next up, we've got another one. So uh, 
why don't you describe to me what, what you're seeing? What, what, what do I need to draw? Excellent. Again, psychologically perfectly normal. Um, this is the law of continuity at work, right? Um, you, you, we also call this the law of the good curve. Uh, what it means is that we perceive continuous shapes as belonging together. So you saw this as one shape and, and this curve as the other one. You could also have said, well, there is one thing that kind of looks like a, you know, a beak from a bird, and there's another beak from another bird, and they're kissing, you know, and it's very cute. Um, but we don't parse this image this way, right? We don't, you know, we don't assemble things this way uh, because we, are, we think that this continuity, continuous form or direction here makes this one object, right? Okay, and then finally, uh, we've got this one. So if I need to, you know, if I need drawing instructions for that, uh, how about, do you want to describe, yeah, do you want to describe to me what do I need to draw? Okay, two buckets near to each other. That's almost psychologically normal, I would say. Uh, any, uh, anything that reminds you of, if you needed to compress your instructions even further? Yeah, the middle line is shorter than the outer line. The middle is a little shorter, yes. Uh, how about you? Yeah? Yes, it does. So, uh, no worries, right? You're good. But a lot of people see an E lying on its side, right? Uh, and, and if that happens, uh, by the way, I love when these things turn out differently between people because that, this is what you're going to deal with in user interface design. It's, it's humans. It's like this gooey mess where everybody is different and you never can quite predict what's happening. Welcome to HCI. Um, so the E letter here is something a lot of people see. And this is, again, your brain at work, right? You let, your brain is basically sitting there and it's reading like, you know, Sportbild or something, right? And then, and then comes in this, this, this impression, right, on the eye. And the brain is like, ah, oh, Jesus, right? I'm imagining this like sad little dwarf reading sport build sitting in my brain, and he's like, ah, oh, another sensory impression. I need to make sense of this. What is it again? It's like, oh, that's a lot of lines, but oh, wait a minute. I've seen this before. That's an E. I'm just going to call this an E lying on its back, and I can go back to reading my sport build, right? Um, so this is basically also a way of, of cognitive compression, if you like. Uh, it's your brain trying to map things that it gets to things that it already knows because this is the way we store information, right? As, at least according to this associative engineering model of how the brain works, we store things by you know, basically connecting them to stuff that we already know. Um, and that is what you would get here in this case. So we call this the law of experience. We tend to file new things into categories that we already know. Um, so we use existing knowledge, which saves le learning effort, also saves memory in the way. Um, and this is also a foundation for the success of metaphors in user interface design, right? We show people something in the user interface and they can immediately relate to things that they already know. Um, we have analogs to real world models like the desktop metaphor, for example, um, that helps us to uh, simplify these things very much. All right, uh, here's another one. So uh, what are you seeing in this one? Um, how about you? Yeah, there. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So, so we are we are clearly perceiving these uh, these smaller pixels that are moving around. Um, as something that belongs together, right? So this is the, what's called the law of common fate, also known as the law of common movement. If you have animated objects within a static environment, then they will appear as a group. Um, uh, you could also call this the tiger law because this is the way that you figure out, you know, back in the jungle, you know, a million years ago or whatever, uh, you know, that, you know, oh, oh, there is the jungle and there is a tiger and I'm, I'm seeing these yellow black stripes moving, you know, consistently, uh, that's probably something that's going to eat me. Right? Uh, so we, actually animation is one of the strongest effects that we have in our environment. So if something moves, your eye is immediately drawn to it, especially if it's in a static, otherwise static background, right? Um, and you know this effect, right? You sit in a room where nothing is, is, you know, everything is still, and something moves, like something falls over, like, what's, what's that, right? So uh, this means that 
uh, anything that moves inside an image uh, or that is animated inside an otherwise static image will be perceived, first of all, it will really stand out. And everything that is animated in, in synchronicity will also be perceived as a group. Right? That is why the blink tag is so successful on the web. Right? Um, you know, not only does it annoy the hell out of you, but it also means that you are actually perceiving these three or four or five things that are blinking as belonging together, although they are not next to each other. Right? So the law of proximity is not suggesting that. The law of similarity is not suggesting that. But the law of um, uh, common fate is suggesting that they belong together. Um, here's another example. Right? So this, again, leads to an effect where you are perceiving these things as belonging together simply through the um, the animation. All right. Um, let's take these and, and apply them uh, or study how the laws are in effect in, in an interface. This is an interface of a microwave. Um, and uh, the first thing that we can see here is the law of experience will be at work when you look at this. Because you look at this and you probably say, oh, I've, I've seen this number pad down here before. That looks like a number pad you know, from like a, a phone or something. Um, and so I know what to do with this. Right? Uh, you will also see this thing and say, like, oh, that looks like a handle. I've seen that before. Um, in the first case, you're right. This is actually a number pad to enter, you know, like cooking times or power levels. In the second case, you're wrong. This is not a handle to open the door. This is actually, believe it or not, it's a, a removable hand scanner to scan the barcode on your frozen food and to automatically set your microwave. So this is a terrible product, right? <laughs> Uh, let me say that right out there. But uh, we're going to continue studying this. So you can see the laws at work, right? And sometimes it's, it works because you, you actually used it to your advantage. Here, it was used, or you know, design was done that ignored that law um, and that actually created what you could call um, you know, a, a suggestion for a wrong turn for the user, right? misleading them. Um, we've got a couple more things. Like this is probably the time because we know this from from clocks all over the world, right? So we, we use these kinds of things a lot. So then we've got the law of um, proximity at work, right? So you can see, for example, that the, uh, the section of the buttons down here is a little bit, you know, th these buttons are pretty close to each other, whereas there's a gap towards the next user interface element, and that helps to strengthen the grouping that is happening there, right? Um, next up, we've got the law of um, bounded regions and where we where you put, we put things inside uh, a closed shape. And that, of course, is happening here with, the, with these things. And again, at the bottom here, I would say it's used in a good way, because this is a button that one says stop cancel, and the other one says add a minute. So both of them have to do with you know, how long the cooking is going to go. The, and then the designer got fancy. He was like, ooh, I created this nice peanut shape below the start button. Let me do this up there again. I have two more buttons that I need to place. Why not also put the shape around? It looks so nice and symmetrical, right? Well, these two buttons are defrost and scan, not necessarily super connected with each other, right? So um, that's not, at least it's not really helping us to use the interface. It's not too bad and it's not too confusing, but it's not helping us very much. Um, and then we've got the law of similarity, of course, at work here too. Uh, the buttons all look the same, right? He, didn't make the mistake, the designer, to make you know, some of the buttons look completely different than others. So that would be terrible, right? If the digit 7 had a completely different button shape than digit 5 or something. But also, um, you know, the designer couldn't resist filling out the square, right? There's two spaces there. And, and empty space is, is often a good enough reason for people to put an interface element there, right? It's not a good reason, but good enough for many people. So, uh, I said, like, oh, I'm going to put the power and the clock buttons there. And I can tell you, you're probably going to be looking for those for a while on this, on this uh, machine if you're wondering, how do I change the power, right? Because you don't expect it to be inside that number pad down there. You would expect maybe a, I don't know, a decimal point or, or something like that, or maybe an OK button or so, stuff like this, but not these power and clock buttons. Um, and by the way, there's another one that I find really interesting, uh, which is this one there. Um, HC, and then there is this tiny little thing. So this, I think, is a great example where uh, the design is completely leaving you up in the air, right? It's much smaller than all the other buttons I'm seeing here, so I'm not even sure whether that circle up there is a button, right? It might be, it may not be. And then if it is a button, 
what on earth does it do? Like high compression for my microwave? I, I don't know, right? Um, or is it the built-in home computer? We, we don't know, and that's a, an example uh, that you know, some of the designs will just leave you guessing. And I mean, hey, it's a microwave. This should be easy, right? This shouldn't be difficult. Um, what we're going to talk about next is the information content in user interfaces. And this is going to go back to a very well-known principle that you guys are all aware of, uh, bits and bytes, essentially. So as the basic unit of information, uh, we're using a bit, as we do in information theory in general. Um, and we're going to think about how much information um, can be passed through a certain user interface component. What does that mean? Well, let's take a simple example. You all know a toggle button, right? Uh, that can either be, so this is just supposed to be one, right? Either on or off, right? So on or off, so checked or non-checked, a checkbox, you could also call it. Um, what is the information content of a single um, toggle button? How much information content does it, does it have? Yeah? Uh, two bits, I'd say, because you have the information that you can press it and that it has another state when you press it, right? Uh huh. Um, well, so I, I see what you're saying with the information that I can press it, that it is selectable. Like, you mean like grayed out or, or, or not grayed out? Is that what you're referring to? Uh, no, more, or, uh, more that it is a button that alone is an information, I, I, I thought. Ah, OK. As to okay. the start button, which you can just press and it, it goes, but uh -huh. it, it, hasn't, it has no other state ah, apart from okay. being pressable. OK. Well, even the start button, uh, even though you just press it momentarily, uh, actually has a, has a push state. So the number of states of these two buttons are the same, but one sort of latches into each of them, and the other one goes automatically back to its normal state when you let go. Uh, and they both, what we're looking at here in the information content is really just that second part of what you said. So just the question of how much information is encoded in basically the state of the interface. Right? So that's one bit then, basically, with these two states. Uh, so how do we get from the two states to one bit? Logarithm, thank you. Uh, so right, log two of two is one bit. That makes it easy to determine, for example, uh, how much information content um, an interface can provide if it has a single digit display. Right? So single digit display, what's the information content? Roughly, yeah? Yeah, go ahead. Three and a half bits? Yeah, somewhere between three and four, right? So apparently, you know, with three bits, you got eight states. Uh, four bits, you got 16. So we're somewhere in between. Right? So uh, with log 2 of 10, we end up roughly with 3.3 bits, if you do the math. Um, so that's, a, that's you know, a certain information content that you basically, an interface will be able to communicate to the user by just having a single digit display. Yeah? Why is it only, like, why is it not 10 bits, like 10 numbers? Ah, OK. Yeah. OK, uh, so one way to think about this is to say, uh, if I had to store the information that this, this uh, display is showing, um, how many bits would I need for that? Right? And, and for numbers between 0 and 9, you, know, you, need, uh, you would need 4 bits, because we don't have 3.3 .3 bits in a computer. right? You'd have to round up to the next bit. But this gives you the idea. So what we're doing. No, we humans don't store it in bits. But when we reason about how much information theoretically can pass through a user interface, that's when we go into bits. Yeah. So, but you're right. We, we are not storing this in a binary form, you know, absolutely. Uh, so uh, this is really a consideration of what the theoretical uh, bandwidth, if you want, is what, what this information, uh, the amount of information that can flow through this interface. Okay. And we're actually going to be using this later on, this, this idea, as sort of an upper bound. And then we will see that certain interfaces have you know, extra stuff in there that doesn't add to the amount of information that's being passed through. And this is where this will help us. Okay. Uh, but yeah, that's a good comment. Thank you. Um, so then if we take the next step, if we say we have a display that can only show one letter, uppercase or lowercase, US um, uh, 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 character set. Um, 
uppercase, lowercase letter, US character set. How much information content? Roughly. Do the math in your head. They're not moving, so you're up. Bit lower than six because 64 would be, you know, so we had 52 letters, right? You know, um, 26 uppercase, 26 lowercase. Uh, so that's 52, it's somewhere below 64. So we're somewhere beneath the six bits. Yeah. So, you know, 5.7. Log two of 52 turns out to be around 5.7. Um, so again, this is the theoretical information content of a display that, uh, you know, has just one. Um, one single letter in uppercase or lowercase, right? Now these are easy because what we're dealing with here are interface components that all have discrete states. So we can count off the number of discrete states and from that we basically get to the information content by doing the log two. It gets a little trickier if you have analog scales. Analog scales, now, you know, you might say, well, an analog scale, like an analog voltmeter or something, like, or an analog gauge of how much water is in a tank, uh, or you know, your gas indicator in, in your old school car, uh, they have an in, infinite number of uh, potential positions, right? So the information content is, you know, is infinite. Um, yes, but this is where we do need to take human performance into account. Not that we're saying they're storing it as bits, but what we do need to understand is that how much information content can a person possibly draw out of an analog scale. And the way that we do this is um, we look at, we let people read analog scales. And so um, you do an experiment, you take an unmarked scale like this, and first you're going to just use maybe two different positions on this one. Um, left and right. And then you're going to ask people a bunch of times, can you tell me, you know, what, what's, your, what's your reading of the scale? And they will say zero and 100% every time, right? You know, uh, easy. So this obviously at least has a capacity of distinguishing two values. So at least one bit is in there. Next, you're going to do this with four positions, right? And you're going to see if you do four equidistant positions on this analog scale, how reliably can people read this and, and distinguish which of the four positions you picked? And you'll again find super reliably, right? So two bits, no problem from an analog scale. You continue this and you find that around three bits, so eight different positions, um, that's where this maxes out. When you do this experiment with more positions than that, when you divide your scale up in finer and finer points, remember we're not putting tick marks on the scale, right? Otherwise you could just read off the value. That's not the idea. We have an unmarked scale. So with eight positions, uh, people can still do this pretty reliably, but then if you go to 16, um, there's a drop off in performance. And so we can say that the information content that can be passed through an analog unmarked scale to a, hum uh, to a human is roughly you know, around three bits. Uh, and then we've got other modalities, right? So we have, for example, audio, right? What about if I have my computer beep at me, right? It, you know, beeps at a certain pitch and at a certain volume. How much information content is that? Again, it's a continuous frequency, so theoretically there should be infinite, infinitely many uh, um, possible ways or, or values that I can communicate with this, but of course what you find is that people cannot distinguish, you know, one hertz intervals or anything like that. In fact, they're not really good at this at all. So with pitch, it turns out when you let people uh, distinguish pitch, a normal person only can distinguish values on the information content order of two and a half bits roughly. Right? So that's less than eight different um, levels of pitch, more like you know, six or so. Um, but you may have heard about people who have perfect pitch. In, in German we say absolutes Gehör. Right? So you play, you, know, you go to them and say like, hmm, and they will say, oh, that's uh, you know, an A flat in the fourth octave or something. Uh, and, and those people, um, you know, I admire them, uh, they actually can get five to six pit, uh, bits of pitch uh, out of a pitch, right? Because they can actually distinguish all these values. Um, 
volume, you might say, well, what about volume? If I just play back you know, softer and louder things, shouldn't that be a really great way to, to communicate information because you don't need to distinguish different pitches and you don't need perfect pitch? Well, volume really sucks as an information uh, channel, right? Because people are really bad at distinguishing reliably different levels of volume. Why? Again, this is me, you know, this is my, my naive view of, of human biology. But my assumption is that this is because uh, our ears are trained to adjust to amazingly broad ranges of dynamics, right? We can hear super quiet things, we can hear super loud things uh, without our ears blowing up. And so because of this uh, behavior, uh, we're actually not good at distinguishing different levels reliably and re recognizing them because our ear is trying to make them all kind of, you know, not the same, but make them uh, work with our brain. So um, not a great one. And so finally, you might say, well, I've got a great idea for a new interface. The new interface is going to be a device that you attach to the USB port on it. And um, then if you want to re make a readout of a value, you just, you just lick it yeah, like this. Yeah, not a great business idea in times of corona. But um, if you were to design this, how many bits can you know, people distinguish by their taste of, you know, their sense of taste for saltiness, for example. It's not great. Um, it's less than two bits, right? So, uh, you know, this is basically people saying, eh, not salty, a little salty, quite salty, and then that's kind of it, right? Um, all right, so what I wanted to show you with this is that we can actually start reasoning about information content in user interfaces. Um, on a somewhat theoretical level, we can do this for discrete uh, interface elements that have discrete states, like buttons and, and, and uh, digits and so on. And we can also do this for analog displays that actually have, theoretically, infinitely many um, distinguishable or infinitely many uh, different levels. But then we go by how many can people reliably distinguish, and that needs to be determined in uh, human psychology experiments. Now, um, the old discussion, right? You've got a car, and some cars have still the, uh, you know, just the analog uh, speedometer, you know, Tacho uh, indicator. Others have the, uh, the digital display, right? Um, which one is better? So that's actually an interesting question. If you take a speedometer of a car, you'll find a bunch of different things in which they, they differ. The first thing is, if you do take an analog display, like the scale or, or the speedometer, um, in the car that what has a needle moving. Um, it enables a couple things. The first one is, um, by just glancing at an analog scale, we are very quick at determining rough ranges. Right? That's it. So analog displays are really glanceable. Right? You can look at them and you get a rough idea. Uh, like if, you if you're, again, monitoring a nuclear power plant, is this thing way over at the right and I need to be worried, or is it you know, on the left and everything is good? Um, so they're really good at that, and they're better in this respect than digital displays. The second thing that analog displays have with a lot of, what a lot of people forget is an analog, analog display will give me the range, right? You know, you get in a car and you see like, oh, the, the, you know, the speedometer goes from zero to, I don't know, 160 or 200 or something. So you know the total range of values that you can expect, and that is also something that helps you with the glanceability, right? It tells you, oh, I'm in the, I'm roughly halfway up, so I'm around 100 kilometers or something like this. Um, digital displays don't give you that, right? If you have a digital display of a speedometer, you don't know how far it can go. You can tell the number of digits, maybe, but that's a pretty rough estimate. Um, and here's another thing that is surprisingly easy with analog systems and surprisingly tricky with digital ones. It's detecting trends. When you look at um, a speedometer while you're driving, and you want to determine, you know, am I getting slower or am I speeding up? And at what rate am I doing that? It's really easy to see whether the needle is creeping up or, or dropping down, right? Um, that's much harder with a digital display. Why? Because until it moves to that next number, it's static, right? And then it moves to a new number. But your brain first needs to read the new number, interpret it, remember the CMN model, and then determine, is it higher or lower than the older one? What's the difference between the two? OK, I guess we're currently dropping in speed pretty fast, or going up in speed pretty fast, or slow, or whatever. So um, trend detection is much easier with analog displays. But all this comes at a price. 
Um, as we saw with the experiment of the unmarked scale, uh, reading precision isn't super high with analog scales. So as you go up in, in, in the number of digits you want to determine, the analog scales tends to start losing. Right? So if I need um, more and more significant digits, it's easy to glance at a display and say, I'm roughly going something between 50 and 55. Right? But uh, if you want to know, is it 52 or 53, you need to actually look more closely. And then if you want to know, is it 52.8 or 52.9, you might already be at the limit of what the analog scale is, is able to tell you. Um, so reading time goes up linearly, it shows in experiments, roughly significantly, uh, with, with the number of significant uh, digits. So uh, digital displays, on the other hand, um, reading time, actually, experiments show is constant up to roughly three or four digits. Right? So a three-digit uh, digital display is something that you can take in. Um, it's not as glanceable as this analog scale, you know, the pointer being on the left or right of a scale, but it takes a little longer, but the time is constant, whether you're reading one digit or two or three or four. That has to do with the chunking and the way that we process information. We can see, you know, uh, you know 120 just as fast as we can see the number seven, basically. Um, estimating is hard, right? You, know, you don't get an estimate. You have to read the number, essentially. You can maybe stop at the third digit, but li like I just said, that's not going to save you any time. Um, trends are super hard to detect, and um, limits are not visible unless they are labeled somewhere externally so you know what the limits are. All right, so that's how we distinguish this uh, between analog and, and, and digital information and what we can uh, get out of it in terms of measurements. Now, a little interlude here uh, on, on literature, because uh, you, we told you guys to you know, get, get the Norman textbook, and I wanted to just give you uh, a little bit of insight on where else information about HCI is being found. Um, the book that you have, the Norman one, is sort of a great introduction to HCI um, from this everyday things perspective and to the psychology behind it, and that's what we're going through at a fast pace right now. Um, then there's other books that I'll talk about in a second. But there's also uh, things like conferences and journals and, and online materials. So as people get into uh, this thing, then you will find that if you want to find out about like, the latest and greatest happening in HCI, um, people turn to conferences and journals. Right? CHI is the biggest conference in, in the field of human-computer interaction. Um, and it covers basically what everybody in the world, all the labs that are studying, uh, the latest developments and are doing the latest research in, in HCI are publishing there. There's a bunch of other conferences um, that sometimes look at more technical material or more designer, designery issues or have more of a Euro-Asian as opposed to US focus. Um, uh, I mentioned uh, the CSCW field already, Computer Supported Collaborative Work. There's a group, uh, there, there's a conference that, that covers that. This is about the social context of, of use when people use things together. Uh, and then there are other more like things like technical ones that you become multimedia, et cetera. Um, also, in, in, in HCI, maybe uh, different from some other disciplines, um, conferences are where most of the action is in, in terms of research. But journals also are being published. And these are three um, Tokai interactions and Puck that uh, are worth looking at. Um, you don't need to remember these names right now, but if you end up, for example, for your thesis or so, digging through related work or for your seminar paper, um, looking for stuff, then these are the sources that you're going to tap to. Uh, how do you get to these? Fortunately, pretty much all of the HCI literature that, that people are paying attention to, that is being read and being cited and, and, and relevant, um, is on the ACM Digital Library. Um, anybody know what the ACM is? Ah, you should, because, yeah, go ahead. You got an idea? Uh-huh. <laughs> it's, um, yeah, it's a digital library where you can search for, like, uh, research papers and journals on topics. And right. And also follow researchers. And stuff. Yeah, so that's the digital library. You're absolutely right. Uh, now, if that was the description of ACM, I could see, like, the, you know, the, the people who are running ACM just silently weeping in the corner. Because ACM is, of course, so much more than a digital library. But you're absolutely right. This is normally what people... Uh, use from the from the ACM, this digital library. ACM is, is the Association for Computing Machinery. It's the global, worldwide, um, basically it's your union. 
you know, you're computer scientists, and ACM is the professional association of people who work in computer science, both in research and in, in practitioners. Um, so it's, it's doing all sorts of things. It's organizing most of these conferences up there, by the way. Uh, it's uh, publishing lots of these uh, uh, journals. Um, it's doing that nonprofit. Um, and um, you know, people who are computer science researchers, students, or, uh, or professionals, or members of ACM. And so and then one of the things that ACM does is it puts all its content onto the digital library, which normally you need to pay for to get into, or you need to be a member of ACM to get into it. But you are RWH students, so lucky you. Uh, RWH has paid for an institutional access to the digital library, and that's why for your pro seminar you can just go in there as long as you're in the RWH network and read all those um, papers for free, basically. All right, more important, I think, for you guys at this point is, is the HCI books, right? So the Norman book uh, is the one that, that we'll talk about. Affordances, mappings, constraints, et cetera. So that's the one we're going, you guys are going through right now. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the other ones that I wanted to point out here are, uh, there is the, uh, the textbook, Human Computer Interaction by Alan Dix and colleagues. Uh, very good general textbook, best single volume textbook, I think, that you can find on, on HCI right now. And then there is um, um, Ben Schneiderman's Designing the User Interface, which has been through many editions over the years. It's been around for a long, long time uh, and keeps getting updated. It's also a great general textbook on HCI, a bit more of a focus on, on, on breadth, right? It covers all kinds of latest developments in different interfaces. Uh, and it's a good bridge between fundamentals, which the Dix book covers well, and, and the current trends in, in research papers and, and journals and so on. And then I have an, uh, uh, an oldie in here, uh, Nielsen's book, Usability Engineering. Uh, even though it's really old, it actually is a great text to explain how to bring usability into a business and how to do it at, you know, at a pragmatic level and actually bring it into companies. Because, I mean, we do this fairly regularly at, um, at the lab. Uh, Marcel is actually one of the people involved in this. And when we try to explain usability to clients, it's always uh, an uphill struggle, right? There's a lot of people still who are running companies who don't understand that you know, the user experience of their products is gonna end, end up deciding whether they're successful or not. Um, so if you wanna find out more about this, there's a, I've, I've created a little uh, curated list of about 10 books or so uh, in HCI um, that I update every now and then uh, when I see something new coming out. All right. Uh, as you are reading Norman, I wanted to point out one more thing. This is more like you know, general advice, or you could also call it me randomly ranting on on stuff. Um, I want to talk about active reading. So as you read this book, I want you to make this your book, right? So highlight a few points per page. Well, don't highlight everything. I know at some point you turn to that zombie like you know with a with a text marker like highlighting everything. Uh, that doesn't make sense. But go through it. Really think about what's the key message here. Highlight it, right? Scribble some brief summaries on the on the margin of that book, right? If you have it in 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 physical form, uh, that makes it particularly easy. You can also do it on the ebook, but it's a little harder that way. Um, you know, put an exclamation mark if something is there that surprises you that you hadn't expected. Um, if you have any crazy associations, saying like or project A is like, oh, that's a wonderful thing. I I could build an interface that solves this issue or whatever. Uh, scribble that down. So don't just read the book. Actually, uh, use it. Um, Use sticky notes liberally, right, um, with keywords. Put them onto pages that you want to keep referring back to. Like when Norman introduces affordances, uh, I guarantee you want to go back to that more than once to reread it. Um, and so, you know, glue in a sticky note there. Type short bullet point summaries in, of each chapter into your favorite word processor to, um, to really sum up the book. This is, of course, this is not just true for you know, Norman's book, but whenever you read a book that you really care about learning, um, this will be my recommended way of doing it. Um, in a way, the way that we we you know we can tell whether you're doing this is if I see the book like I see your book lying there on the table. If I can, if if you could tell from this distance that it's your book and not somebody else's, then you're doing a good job, right? Um, so make sure that you really make it yours. What this is going to do for you is it's going to increase the value of that book for you many times. And you're probably not going to throw that out because it is actually sort of a, a a worked on physical manifestation of what you learned. Uh, here's an example of, of one of our students who uh, kind of did that. Um, 
So as you can see here, there's all these things highlighted in multiple levels of sticky notes, right? And marked up stuff. And uh, so this may not be your style, but I can tell you, he could tell that it was his book from you know, 10 feet apart for sure. Um, uh, so this is what you need to do to really you know, grok a subject, to really get into it. Now, um, as we start um, looking at the, the book Design of Everyday Things, um, this book originally came out in, in the late 80s as published as The Psychology of Everyday Things. And Norman realized nobody buys books that have psychology in the title. So he renamed it to Design of Everyday Things. It sold like hotcakes. And it has become one of the Bibles for, for HCI. After writing many more other books, um, uh, Don re revised this one and, and uh, republished it in 2013. I've been able to hang out with him occasionally at, at uh, UCSD. Uh, he's a great person, really insightful to, to talk to him. Um, and one of the things that um, the book introduces to HCI is the concept of affordances. Uh, that's probably the one that is maybe best known for. But there are a few other things in there um, that I think are really interesting. Um, there are some other books that Norman wrote. Uh, just a brief overview if you want to see more about the, his stuff, you can see Things That Make Us Smart, The Invisible Computer, Emotional Design, uh, The Design of Future Things, and Living with Complexity. So uh, he's been a very busy writer um, and uh, definitely worth uh, picking up a few more of his, of his books. We're going to go through some of the key concepts from this book now. Uh, and the first one I want to talk about is visibility. Uh, visibility comes up early in, in, in the textbook um, as a fundamental feature of a good user interface. Um, and what do we mean by visibility? Uh, I think that's well explained by this review. Um, this is a, another uh, uh, page I like. It's called webpages.suck.com. Um, and uh, in this, uh, the guy who you know, just rants about web pages that he doesn't like, uh, so that's under entertaining. And, and then he, in, in, he identifies, I think it's Qualcomm's website at this point, uh, and he says they have a certain design pattern that they're using that he calls mystery meat navigation. You know, mystery meat is, is the stuff that's in like the burger where you don't really know where the meat is coming from, right? So you're like you you're, you keep guessing whether uh, you know, you're safe or not. And and so this is what he calls mystery meat navigation. Let me just play this for you, uh, so you get an idea of what what this is about. Uh, this has a bit of audio, so I hope you can be able, you'll be able to hear this. It's not just small companies or music sites or band sites or sites that really don't count that use mystery meat navigation. Even big companies go stupid sometimes. And here's an example, Qualcomm. If you look up here in the right-hand corner, you see the mystery meat navigation. You have to mouse over this thing. Oh, now you can see what it does. Oh, okay. This is the latest news, and this is Ventures, and where was CDMA? Uh, oop, oop, oop. There it is. People are not going to memorize your navigation, and this isn't very impressive except to people who should know better. Don't use this technique. <laughs> okay, so, so you get the idea. Uh, what's missing in this in this uh, website on on a very fundamental level, I would say probably the designers actually went out of the way to to avoid it is is visibility. Right? Um, visibility means um, being able to see what the interface offers, right? Being able to see what's there, what what state we're in, because our brain is really good at interpreting any clues we give uh, we give it, and then making up. Uh, cause and effect, like determining cause and effect. And if there is nothing, then it's going to come up with something. Um, a lot of the world's ev everyday knowledge is actually out in the world and not in our head. We're going to come back to that later. Um, a lot of the things that we uh, tend to use for everyday um, you know, survival, basically, is stuff that we learn from the environment. We take the information from the environment. And for that to be possible, it needs to be visible. Now, Visibility isn't just about the actual you know, visual sense of the eye, uh, but mostly since interfaces are predominantly visual, uh, you will see examples um, that show you that this is, um, actually has to do with things you can see. Um, so 
ideally, uh, in a good interface, you will have natural clues, right? Uh, again, going back to this, this, this pen here, uh, not only is it using this um, you know, clearly different color of the, the, the pen cap here, but it's also a different texture. Um, and once I've learned how to open and close it, I'm not going to forget about it. So it's giving me everything I need to know how to use it. But it's also very simple. It's just a pen. Right? This gets incredibly hard when you have more and more complex technology. It's already more difficult on this guy. Right? Yeah, it has one, two, three, four, five buttons. And the middle one is actually a little bit of a, a joystick, too. Um, to, to go back and forth, and, and that's all pretty clear. They're lit up even, so I can see them easily. But uh, there are other buttons on this one, little slider switches on the side, uh, which are not that super easy to discover. So we actually put a little tag next to them, because if you have them in the wrong setting, this thing doesn't work. Right? So that's a little bit of a less exciting example of visibility. Um, so natural design would uh, hopefully not require me to think consciously at all. Like when I use this pen, I don't need to think about how to use it, right? Um, that's an, it's a natural design that is super easy to use without me having to, to reason about it. Um, so you want to make just the right things visible. Uh, you don't want to throw too much information at the user, which is an interface mistake that engineers often make. They just put everything out there because who knows? You know, somebody might want to use it. So I'm just going to, there's some room in the interface. Let me put a button there. Um, literally. I was at a company once that we were consulting for, for a usability. We were giving them a usability training. And I looked at an interface that they had made uh, for a customer. And I said, uh, so what's that button doing there? And, and they were like looking at each other like, we don't really remember. But at some point, some customer on some version of this project asked us to put that button there. And we never dared take it out, because maybe somebody's still using it. And there, were also, there was still space, right? I'm like, oh god. Face palm. Um, so this is what you get a lot when people design interfaces that haven't really thought about how to do it. Um, but let me show you the Swedish hairdryer. I went to a conference in Sweden, um, and in you know in the hotel room, I found this this uh, hairdryer. And my first reaction, of course, was, this is cute, right? It's like bubbly and you know, it's awesome. Swedish design, probably. So uh, I mean, it's called Hagen. I mean, how how more how much more cute can you get? Um, and uh, I thought, this is really a great hairdryer, until I picked it up and tried to turn it on. So let me hear some thoughts. What do you think is, how do I need to turn this on? What, what do you think is, is the right thing to do? Uh, for my first guess, it would be to press this. OK, pressing a button. All right. Any other things you might try? Oh, see, lots of ideas. Yeah. Uh, it kind of looks like a slider. Uh -huh. Yeah, right, right. So you can move it in both directions, maybe, right? Possibly. Maybe. Any other ideas? So pushing, sliding up and down, yeah? Yeah, yeah. It's, it could also be an indentation to, to turn this whole thing, right, around like a, like a dial. Uh, guys, this is just a hairdryer, and here we are discussing <laughs> how to turn it on. That's really sad, right? I mean, from a product design point of view. Not for us. We're not sad. Um, so. This is something we can do. Next question I have for you guys. How many levels does this hairdryer have? Yeah, he's like shaking his head. Yeah, want to make a guess? Yeah. At, you're guessing at least two. I like that. He's keeping it safe, right? Yeah. <laughs> Could be more. Ah, one direction up, one direction down, possibly. Yeah, other thoughts? <laughs> one on and two off states, because there's a double zero on the interface, yeah. So again, uh, we should not be discussing this, right? We should not be discussing how many levels this freaking hairdryer has. Uh, but here we are. So let me show you what happens is actually uh, you push it, right? So uh, you push it up, and then it reveals, next to the double zeros, it reveals the one, right? And now the zero and one are showing. So now I think we're getting somewhere, right? So what do we do for getting to, to level two now? Yeah? Pushing down, maybe. Or, or keep pushing up more, right? So uh, in fact, one of these two answers, from a design point of view, would be right. The other one would be wrong from a design point of view. But 
you're thinking like, okay, this thing is messed up. It's probably, you know, okay. So, uh, so how you actually get to the ne next level is you go back to zero and push the other way, right? And then zero and two pops out. Um, yeah, oh my God, exactly. That's what I was, I was thinking. So there's a bunch of things wrong with this, and we're going to talk about uh, what these things are. The first thing that's wrong with this uh, hairdryer is visibility, right? Um, when I pick this up, I cannot see how many levels this has, so I'm not seeing what's available, right? I also cannot see from its design how to get to those levels, so the actions that I could do with it are not clear. Um, and then, actually, when I pick it up, uh, let's say I pick it up at this setting, would you bet your life on whether it's on or off right now? Uh, I'm not sure, right? So even the current state of the interface, or when the double zero is showing, like, you know, what's that suggesting? Um, it's not super, super clear what current state it is in even, right? So all these things are not well designed in this one. Now, um, here's your next exercise. Uh, you know, take three minutes. This should be super easy. With your neighbor, redesign the Swedish hairdryer. Make it better. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. This is, you've solved all the problems, right? Uh, so many people, you know, go overboard and, you know, oh, I'm going to do a voice interface or whatever, you know. Um, it, it, you know, really keep it, keep it simple, right? Uh, that's the idea here. And, and um, of course, what was tempting these designers was to be different, right? They wanted to do something kind of new and fresh and so on. And fresh is one of those warning labels on interface designs, right? Um, sometimes you just want to do something that really works for people uh, and not try to change it around too much from the things that, you know, you make best use of the Gestalt laws and the natural laws of interaction that, that nobody can, you know, can, can deny are there. So improving the Swedish hairdryer means, first of all, um, one thing that is actually surprised. Yeah, go ahead. You wanted to say something. Oh, oh, okay, I see what you mean. Yeah, I, I, we're just redesigning the interface at this point, right? So we're assuming it has two levels at this point, um, and, and that's just what you create the interface for. So somebody else, some marketing guru has determined that we really want to sell hair dryers with two levels, right? That's, that's it. Um, uh, but I, I know what you're saying, of course, makes a lot of sense. You want to do actually some kind of root cause analysis and ask, is that actually the right hair dryer to sell, right? Or do 99% of our people always crank it up to full anyway, and, and do we even need that second level, or do they want something else instead, right? Um, but if we just stick with the interface uh, question for now and say, like, we do have these levels 0, 1, and 2 that we need to somehow offer to the user now, one mistake that is made surprisingly often, including iOS uh, for ever, like ever since it's been out, uh, is not detaching numbers or labels and buttons. Right. So the hairdryer had, one of the issues that it had was that the labels for its current state, literally 0, 1, and 2, were on the button that you're moving. And this is bound to confuse people because there's always the ambivalence of, does the label mean that if I see it, it's currently on? Or does the label mean if I see it, I need to push it so it disappears and then it's on? We've all had these, you know, these, uh, you know, uh, rocker switches, right, where something sticks out and you're like, well, does that mean that this is now the active thing or is the active thing one that I've pushed in? It's confusing. There is no right answer. The same thing is true for the very simple iOS toggle switch, right? Or we are also seeing it in macOS now occasionally. Um, it's got, you know, this, this slider thing that can be on the left-hand side or the right-hand side, right? You know what I'm talking about, this little... Uh, green slider, basically, right? The green, green toggle. So, and again, it doesn't have a labeling beneath the button or above that, that, that toggle that says which one is which, right? And because it doesn't have that, there's always a little remaining doubt on, okay, is this on or is it off? Because we cannot, con we cannot determine which is the state and which is the action. So it's my random rant on people not label, you know, deter detaching labels from from buttons. Yeah, go ahead. I think there's an example for like power 
Yeah, exactly. And uh, again, that's one where you know it's not a hundred percent clear how the meaning is really supposed to be interpreted. When the when uh, on the other hand you have what he just showed, which is you've got three labels that say zero, one, and two, and you've got a slider next to that pointing at one of those three. There's no way you could ever misinterpret that, right? So it's so easy to resolve these things. But of course, on a smartphone, it needs a tiny little bit more space in the interface, right, to put the label next to the slider. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where you like have the lighting like of the activity. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say that like the the light turns on me is occupied or is created. <laughs> yes, absolutely. That's another example. If that again had two lights that said you know, occupied or free, and one of them was you know indicated in some way, then it would be much easier to determine. Yeah. So that's one thing. Detaching labels and controls makes a lot of sense. The second thing, of course, is to provide an at a glance overview of possible settings. Like what can I do? Again, your design does that, right? I look at it, I immediately see there's 0, 1, and 2. I know this thing has two power levels. Uh, the next thing is to design it so that you, it, it's easy to see how it can be operated, right? So for example, can it be pushed or can it be you know, um, slid up and down or is it something to turn? Um, we can do a much better job at that than what the Swedish hairdryer is doing. Um, and then finally, making the current setting of the control against the scale easy to determine. This is answering the question, where am I? Navigation-wise, right? Not not where am I? Am I in Sweden? But where am I? Is the is the is the Sierra on or off, right? What, what's the current state of the interface? This was hard to determine reliably um, in the original model. Uh, it's much easier with with your design that you showed because I can see whether that little arrow is next to the zero or next to the one or next to the two. And then there's one more thing we haven't talked about yet. We're going to get to that next, uh, which is about mappings. One thing that confused us here was that. You know, going one way led to level one, and then I had to go the other way for level two. That's not a natural ordering of levels, right? The natural one is zero, one, and two in a row, right, in the same direction. And ideally, up means more power and down means less power. We're going to get to that uh, later in class. Uh, so a natural ordering of these settings makes a lot of sense. And at that point, you know, this is one that does that, right? You know, so here's one that has a little thing that has off, low, and high next to it. And you can push this little thing up and down. Very simple on that level. Uh, maybe boring, right? You know, a product designer, industrial designer might say, oh, but we've seen this so many times. They say, yes, because it works, right? Um, so, and we need to also, of course, think about design for use, right? A lot of people need to operate their head, right, or they like to operate with one hand, right? Turn it on and off while they're uh, uh, holding it in their hand. Um, the labels shouldn't be wearing off, right? So if this is gone after a while, then it's less easy to use for somebody who doesn't know the hairdryer, like somebody visiting. Um, you want this to be water resistant. You know, the, maybe you want to be able to change the voltage if it's a traveling design. So there's lots of other questions that we need to ask to make a hairdryer really work. This is just the immediate things that we can derive without having to think, and this is important, without having to think about the precise user and task and context and so on. Right? This is because of fundamental psychological truths that one design is better than the other. So if anybody tells you, oh, you're doing design, that's all opinion, you're like, no. In certain areas, it's not. It's very clear one is better than the other. Unfortunately, for many of these things, the answer is not so easy. Right? For many decisions in your design, you will not be able to just pull out a psychological rule and say, this is how it needs to be done. Because if you're designing a hair dryer for travel, it needs to have a voltage setting. If it's not designed for travel, you don't need that, and it complicates the de device. Right? So in many situations, you need to figure out what the best solution is, and the answer isn't clear from the start. But for certain things, it is. All right, so above all, the rule to apply, we're going to get to like a whole collection of, of design uh, golden rules. So uh, the first rule is keep it simple. Right? Don't overcomplicate things uh, if it's not necessary. Now, visibility is a tricky beast, because if you don't provide clear visibility of the current state, the available actions, and how to get to those uh, actions, and how to, how to basically trigger them, then people are going to make something up. Right? So uh, if there is no visibility, what it will lead to is that people start thinking about uh, false causalities. Right? Um, have you ever had this, like your parents calling you saying, 
oh, I printed a letter and now the, I broke the internet, right? That happens because, you know, in the lack of visibility of what's technically going on in the system, people are building their own causal relationships, right? Um, so that's a, that's a bad effect that you can have when your visibility uh, is lacking in your interface. And let's be honest, we've all been there. I, mean, I don't know whether you've been around when uh, you could, you know, still burn two CDs, but I know when I was burning a really important CD, I would sometimes, like, casually touch the computer to make sure the vibrations, you know, didn't get too crazy so it would succeed writing. So we all build these superstitions. Um, or, like, you have a system that's not responding. What do we do? If you click on a button, nothing happens. You wait for, like, you know, 1.7 seconds, and then you click again. And then if still nothing happens, you click like 50 times, right? <laughs> uh, why are we doing that, right? It's, it's, we have certain ideas. And then, of course, the chaos when all those clicks then suddenly actually get through and you buy 15 copies of, you know, Norman's book or something. Um, there is another constraint that we're not going to talk much about because I want to stick with the psychological questions and the questions of actually making things work for people in use. Uh, we're not going to get into marketing here. Um, but it's got to be clear that a better UI isn't, uh, isn't automatically a business goal. For many people, they don't see the relationship there. This is getting better. You know, companies are getting it more these days than they did maybe 10, 20 years ago. Um, but there's also um, a, a different problem here, uh, which is that consumers, actually, that buy devices, buy services, buy apps, need to also prioritize usability over uh, other things before the industry really will change, right? So I, I don't know about you, but I've, I've seen people walk into MediaMark, you know, like out for buying a microwave. I had to actually buy a microwave the other day. Uh, ours broke down. And so uh, you see people walk in there, and they turn into these zombies. They only have two things in their mind, like how much does it cost and how many things are listed on that little you know, tag next to it, how many features does it have, right? Oh, I can get a microwave with five things for 50 bucks, but this one has seven things and it's only 60 bucks. That's a good deal. I get two more things for 10 bucks, right? They don't really care whether they need those features or whether they act, those features actually complicate the use or whether this thing is usable at all, right? They just look for features. Um, and, and that's not good for usability, right? That doesn't lead to picking a usable product. Um, on the other hand, I had a, a wonderful thing happening to me uh, a couple of years ago. I walked in and I was looking at, I don't know, alarm clocks or something, and again, media marked, right? Uh, or maybe Saturn to keep it balanced. Um, and, and I heard a discussion going on in the next round. It's like, you know, the next aisle, people were saying, like, oh, look, there's this new, you know, this new smartphone. Yeah, but, you know, the buttons are not aligned right. And look, you know, they, they're not following the Gestalt laws. And I was like, what? <laughs> I'm having impact, right? Yeah, I turned around. Of course, there were two DIS students that were discussing these phones. So um, I haven't reached um, the general public quite yet, but my goal is at least to turn you all into nitpickers when it comes to bad interface design, and also hopefully to people who will appreciate good user interface design uh, when you see it. Yes? Oh, yeah. So, like, yeah. the keyboard, for example, like, yeah. you look at the keyboard anymore, so it doesn't leave good labeling or something. Right. It's a good, like, layout. Yeah, and yeah, maybe yeah. Maybe the same is happening to, like, certain products, like, phone, which you use every day. Yeah. Even if it's a bad design from the buttons, like, after a, a few days, it doesn't matter. Yeah, because the brain yeah. The stuff is good at every layout. Yeah, so, so there's actually two truths in what you said. The first one is, uh, yes, so a lot of things, by by using them for a long time, like, you know, the use of a, of a device over time leads to a learning curve that's happening that at some point then more or less saturates at the point that you're willing to invest. Um, and if that point is enough for your own like, you know, needs for, with the product, you're good. Uh, but the other thing is um, people often, they may pick something that is actually terrible to use, but because we, our brains are really good at dealing with these kinds of problems, we figure it out anyway. Right? So you will see people using things that are really, really cumbersome and really badly designed, and they will still use them successfully. 
but it does come at a cost, right? There's actual effort involved, and from a business point of view, usually people don't build a lot of loyalty to those kinds of products. And then they're like, if I can do this in any easier way, you know, I'm going to chuck this thing out the door. Okay, so um, here's an example of, of, of where I thought I that, was, that made me happy. Like Philips had this really lame claim, by the way, let's make things better. Yeah, like what's the, op what's the alternative, right? Uh, anyway, uh, so they changed it and they said, sense and simplicity. I like that, right? You know, simplicity actually made it into the tagline of one of the biggest electronics companies in the world. So that was nice. Um, uh, now it's kind of, uh, it got lame again. It's like innovation and use. Like, uh, okay. But for a while they were really on a, on a good track here. And in general, they actually do have a reasonably good sense of, of um, usability and user-centered design in their, in their products who doesn't have a good sense of user interface design uh, were the folks from, um, uh, who, who installed our old university phones. These phones are now gone, by the way. Uh, we now have IP phones, which is a different problem. But uh, these phones had, had some wonderful problems. How do you check your voicemail on this one? You know, first three rows can probably take an educated guess here. Yeah. Yeah, that one, right? I'm going to zoom in here for everybody. This one has actually a button that has a little, uh, has a little mail label on there, right? Uh, that looks promising. But no, it's much easier. You just have to dial star 71. <laughs> That's how you call your voicemail, right? Uh, this is a visibility problem, right? Uh, not, uh, this is actually worse than no visibility. This is like leading you down the wrong path, right? So we had no visibility of how it actually needs to be done, and there was something there that gave me a wrong clue to do it. Yes? Yeah, like the oh, no, nothing really. It's not programmed. Um, okay. you, know, you press it and, and nothing happens. <laughs> um, so, yeah, and just, you know, if you try to think about, uh, oh, sorry, uh, how that happens, right? Probably, I talked to folks from the ITC at some point. They said, well, you know, these phones were installed at some point, and then we didn't find, have enough money to pay for all the extra customizations, and somebody decided, ah, oh, we're not going to use, not everybody's going to have the fancy phone with the extra buttons, so we're not just going to install it for all people. It's going to be simple. We only need to write one manual for everybody. They can all enter star 71, even on the phones that don't have these extra buttons. Um, and so, you know, that's often the decision that's being made, right? Less work for the team. Uh, installing it for the developers uh, customizing it or building it uh, and users then suffer by the millions for, for years and years. Uh, there are more issues, right? For example, with these phones, tone dialing wasn't working by defa default. I had uh, several PhD students from the US and they came over and they said, Jan, I can't get through this phone menu. I'm calling and then I, they asked me to press one to, for English or something and, and this thing hangs up when I do that. I'm like, that can't be right. So we looked at it, and sure enough, you know, when you pressed a button while you had a connection, this thing was doing something weird that disconnected your call. You had to actually press star, star eight, which would then activate tone dialing, and then you could, well, anyway. Um, you know, to retrieving missed calls, you retrieved your missed calls that, that had run up, right? So it would show you the number, and you look at it, uh, and after looking at it, you're like, okay, so who else called? Okay, okay, so let me get back to the first one. No, no, the first one's gone at that point. Uh, which actually was not a technical issue, but that was an issue that had to do because, of course, the, you know, the Personalrat, so the, 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 the labor union, basically, of, of the people working at the university said, no, no, we don't want old calls to be traceable uh, again because then you know, some evil boss could determine that this person was in the office or not in the office at that time. So it had to do with that. Uh, but it made, of course, usability you know, really suffered under this. Um, and there are lots more issues. And, and I mean, you may have seen these kinds of things with mobile phones too, right? Um, blocking caller ID sometimes still requires you to enter some weird uh, number code into your smartphone if you want to trigger that network feature. Here's a quick story about British Rail's shelters, like the things they set up where you, uh, at, at, their, at their bus stops and, and train stops. Um, so they found that these shelters were th had, you know, were vandalized routinely, um, and they had glass walls. Uh, one of these reasons, psychologically speaking, is that glass uh, really suggests to break it, right? Glass looks like an easily breakable material, 
And for certain people, it's fun, and you know, you expect a, a big, you know, shower of shards when you when you kick it in, and a nice crunching noise. So uh, glass, in a way, affords. This is the term that I'm, I'm I'm leading to affordance here. Uh, affords being broken, uh, meaning that it suggests that action um, to you. Um, now, what bridge rail did is they replaced these things with equally strong plywood. Right? This was no more robust than the glass walls, uh, but the wood panels no longer suggested, you know, that it would be a lot of fun to kick this thing in and to get these effects. Uh, you know, the wood looks more robust, even though physically or you know, it actually wasn't. Um, so wood is a material that suggests or affords stability and support rather than this, this breakability. And sure enough, the demolishing stopped when they did this kind of change. But something else happened. Now people started scribbling on these, you know, plain wood, uh, wooden walls. So because the plywood, you know, smooth, even surface was suggesting that it's really good to write upon. Right? Um, so what that means is that we're seeing that even plain materials can suggest or, you know, make easy certain actions and, and not suggest other actions. And this will lead to the term affordances. Affordances is a model um, that Don Norman proposes in his book uh, that you guys are reading uh, for HCI, but he's not the first one to use the term. It actually comes from uh, Gibson, who in the 70s used this term affordances to describe uh, what kind of things an environment offers the animal. Uh, you can read more about that in, in, in the textbook. Like an animal in the desert, for example, there's only sand, so it will, you know, it will learn to dig in, right? Because that's the only thing that's, that's being afforded, that's being offered to it to do. Um, in HCI, and this is what, what Norman, you know, how Norman transferred this concept, in HCI, with affordances, we mean the actions that an object allows a user to do with it. Uh, or more precisely, an affordance is a relationship between the properties of an object and the capabilities of the agent, you know, the user. Um, and these, th this relationship determines just how the object could possibly be used. You can see here uh, that actually uh, the affordance depends on both the object and the user. Right? So for example, um, if, you know, if you see a chair, if, you know, then uh, the form of the object and your prior expertise and, and what you know, your experience, will suggest to you, and, and your capabilities will suggest to you to sit down on it, right? But if it was like a giant chair uh, and you weren't that big, then it may not suggest sitting on it to you, but you might actually find, you know, for, for your stature, this chair is not affording sitting. So now affordances are almost like the, uh, you know, the Gestalt laws. They are just there, right? They will exist, right? Affordances are the things that an object suggests to do with it. And um, you can design so that certain affordances become prominent or that certain affordances don't become prominent. Um, but if performances can be visible or they can actually be hidden. You may not see them. Let me show you some examples of this later on. But before we get to that, um, Norman actually revised this design, this concept of affordances later in his book here in, in the 2013 edition. You will see the revised version of it, where he said, Affordances are just part of the story. An affordance tells me what I can do with an object. And for example, a smartphone's touch screen is basically, with our experience now, suggesting to us that we can touch it. Um, but where to touch to reach a certain effect and you know, what button to press, that's something else. And this is something that Norman calls signifiers. So signifiers are the signaling components of an affordance. Like, it, it signifies the, the affordance. So affordances means what action, and signifiers tell me where to do it, put simply. Um, and affordances are important for design, but signifiers, especially in, in interface design on, in software, um, may even be more important than the actual affordances. Now, the most usable design is reached when uh, you have uh, an affordance that is easily, that is easily perceivable, uh, it's basically its own signifier. We don't need to add anything else to it. Uh, it just works. But if an affordance is not immediately perceivable, you need to add a 
uh, signifier. Now, let me show you an example uh, of this here. Um, when you look at this, uh, this unlock screen here, you can see this, this, this animation, right? You know, slide to unlock. It goes from left to right, like this, this little flashlight going through. And that is actually an example of, you know, yes, this thing has a touch screen, but in order to know what to do to unlock it, I ne still need to know where and how to touch it. And that's what the signifier here is doing. Now, signifiers cannot only be visual. They could be sound coming from a particular location or um, physical button ridges that indicate where the button is exactly. Uh, so they can have different uh, shapes. Now, signifiers can be intentional or they can be unintentional. Um, any sign, any label, any, any you know, uh, labeling on a, on a device or an, or, or an interface uh, is an intentional signifier because it was put there intentionally, obviously. Uh, you know, the, the famous click here buttons are intentional signifiers. But there are unintentional ones or accidental ones too. For example, um, if you're, you know, if you are hiking in snow terrain and you see this footpath, that is a signifier to you that, you know, tells you this is where, you know, it's, it, it seems to be, you know, where other people have been walking, but they didn't leave these intentionally, right? They just happened as a side effect. Or uh, looking up, you know, at a, at a flag that's being uh, raised by a, in, in a government building and you can actually derive the wind direction from that flag, even though that wasn't the original intention of the flag's design. Either way, uh, users interpret these signifiers as very strong cues uh, in order to use an object. So, uh, what can we do with affordances and signifiers? Uh, if we have an affordance that we can immediately perceive, it gives us a really strong clue to how to use the object. Uh, we don't need extra instructions. Um, we don't need extra labels. Um, so, those are the best ones, right? For example, if you have, um, you know, this, 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 Coming back to the pen here. This pen didn't need a label saying, you know, this is the cap and this is the way that you pull it off, right? It wasn't necessary um, because I could derive that from the pen automatically. This is not always the case. There are pens that you look at and you're like, so how am I going to get, you know, the, uh, the writing end out and you, you need to turn it or to flip something or push a button and they can be very confusing. Uh, but if it's designed well, this, you know, is easy and natural. Uh, and you perceive the affordance immediately, and you know how to use it. If that's not the case, then you need maybe labels, right? You need to explain how to do this. So, for example, doors that have a label on it that says push to open, that means that it's not clear enough from the door's design that you need to push it to open it. Um, and that's often an indication of suboptimal design. When you need to label something, maybe, you know, the designer didn't do a good enough job of making it natural how to use this thing. And that is also true uh, oftentimes for many software UIs. Um, although this needs to come with a caveat. There are some functions like, you know, reformat this text in, in, in left, uh, 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 flush left and, and ragged right and, or, or sort these things by the third column or something. Some fairly complex commands in a user interface don't have a natural visual direct representation. There's no good icon for them, right, to indicate how they work. So sometimes you do need these labels, these texts explaining how to do certain operations. But what we can do is, um, you know, product design can definitely support usability uh, by using perceived affordances and using signifiers really well. Again, I have a wonderful example of a device that tripped me up no end. I bought this headlamp, right, you know, uh, years ago. Um, and uh, this, this headlamp has, uh, uh, has batteries inside it, and, and you're supposed to wear it on your head, uh, and then, you know, obviously turn it on to, to make it work, right? So, let me show you what it looks like. Uh, one end of it, uh, as you can see, it has these cool wings on both sides of it, right? So here's a view from one end, and as you can see here, that looks you know, like really like something that you want to twist. Like, so you put this headlamp on, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to try to twist these things, right? Um, and apparently this became so much of an issue that the manufacturer put don't twist next to that, right? <laughs> um, because, uh, you know, twisting there wasn't working. It was actually breaking this thing if you put enough force on it. This was just a cheap device, right? Um, on the other end, you know, on the other side of this thing, you could twist it. But when you twisted it, you actually opened the battery compartment. Right? So 
I'm imagining myself, you know, up there in the rock wall, 2,000 meters above ground, right? You know, it's getting dark. I'm going to turn on my trusty headlamp, and you're like, clink, psh, there goes your batteries, right? That's awesome. Um, how do you actually turn this thing on? So you can't turn the one end side because it breaks it. You can't turn the other one because then the batteries fall out. How do you turn this thing on? <laughs> no, there isn't. It's a good idea, but there is a button, but it's there. This thing is actually a little rubbery thing that you can actually push in sideways to turn on the headlamp. So uh, just as an example how even a super simple device like a headlamp, again, we shouldn't be discussing how the headlamp you know, is operated, right, can mess it up so badly um, you know, with some fancy uh, wing design that, you know, it basically breaks all the affordances. It makes all the mistakes, right? It, it leads to affordances and you know, that, that suggest turning, strongly suggest turning, but that's not what you should be doing, because either way, either you break it or you, you know, pop open the battery compartment. Um, and the actual way, thing that you are supposed to be doing is, is hidden away. Um, OK, so some examples taken from, from Norman's book. This is a, uh, um, this is a door with these big, flat surfaces, right? So what's that suggesting? Well, push, right? Push to open. Um, that would be good design if you could push to open the doors. It turns out you can't. You need to pull. So what needs to happen, because people keep bumping into those doors, is that somebody needed to add a label called pull, right? To say, you actually need to pull to open this door, right? Or even though the physical design suge strongly suggests pushing gets better, though. Turns out, on the right-hand side, you do need to push. <laughs> on the left-hand side, you pull. Right? So there's another layer of wrongness here in this design, because not even is it you know, consistently the other way, but it's actually inconsistent. Right? So you've got the same physical design with two different directions. I guarantee you, you go to this building once a month. Every time you go there, you'll have to read these labels again and figure it out. Right? You won't be able to um, build a natural memory of this. Here's another one. Um, this is an IKEA uh, shoe shell um, or shoe whatever. Um, how do you open the door? Yeah, you made the movement, right? You, you did this, right? Clearly. Why? It's in the middle of the top uh, of this you know, lid, and it has this you know, horizontal shape. So clearly, pull it open. No, that's not how it works. <laughs> this is how it works. Okay. Can you see how it would have been so easy to do a really good job of this design? Right? Just put the handle somewhere else, probably at a 90 degree angle, make it vertical, and put it on the side where the door opens. Right? Um, but you know, this design is, I don't know what they were thinking. Those Swedes. you know. Um, probably the guys who also made the hair dryer. Uh, so now, so what we saw with this, uh, with this door here, um, you know, a false affordance, which is what this push plate here is, it's an affordance to push, but it's false. It's not what you are supposed to be doing. Um, you know, this suggests an action that isn't, isn't actually possible, right? Um, there is another example of an accidental affordance that, um, you know, for example, that is unintended by the designer. And these things can be helpful or they can be not helpful. So one example is if you have people um, sitting on a staircase, that is because you know, the staircase was designed to walk up and down, but it also affords sitting. So it's good enough. People can sit down there, take a little break, right? if it's wide enough to still pass by. But then um, this one here is a little picture of you know, there's a staircase and there's a little shelf up here. Like, this is just supposed to be a wall. But it was designed wide enough so you can put it down an empty Coke bottle on it. Guess what happens, right? After all, you've got lots of empty bottles on that corner. Everybody puts their trash there. So um, that was also not intended by the design, and it's also not helpful, right? Um, so if a, if a signifier doesn't suggest the right action, then it's misleading, right? So here, we knew that the door somehow needed to be pulled but you know the handle was put in the wrong place in the wrong direction, so it suggested not you know it suggested the wrong action to us. It was misleading as a signifier. Now um, we said that the brain is really wired to make sense of what we perceive and to group things, but that's only the first step of what we do. 
um, your brain is actually amazing when you think about how it continuously builds models of how it thinks stuff works on the inside. Um, because we are surrounded by an endless amount of objects. Um, one count, I think Norman mentions this, says that you are probably interacting with well, on the order of 20,000 things on a day, right? So every day you encounter 20,000 things and you somehow know how to operate them all. You don't have a long book and look up, okay, so how does this pen work again, right? How does this remote work again? You tend to know. And how do we cope with that? Well, first of all, our mind is wired to make sense of stuff, right? Then if the design has affordances, um, they will support using objects, hopefully, in an easy way. Um, and finally, designers can actually, if they take care of it, can do a good job of creating an image of how the system works that then transfers into my mind. This is a weird connection, right? The designer designs the interface. The designer has an idea of how the system works in their head. And by designing the interface in the right way, the same image is being recreated in, in my head as a user. If that works successfully, and if the image is, is a correct and useful one, then uh, the design has succeeded. Um, but whether the designer took great care of doing that or not, doesn't really matter. We do create a conceptual model. The question is, is it the right one? Right? So even when you look at these scissors, for example, um, you know, there will be essentially only one way you pick up these scissors. Well, you're not going to pick them up at the sharp end, right? That's something you learn pretty early in life. But then, you know, there's this tiny hole and the big hole. And after fumbling with this for a second, even if you've never seen these scissors before, you're going to pick them up with, you know, two fingers through that uh, wide hole. One, you know, the thumb goes through the other one and you have them in your hand in the right way the, the designer intended. So that design provides a good conceptual model um, because once I have them in this hand, this way, they work as they were designed to work. Um, if you take, on the other hand, uh, this, uh, this watch here with these four identical looking buttons, um, then I will need, you know, I'm going to build a model of how this thing works, probably by pushing combinations of these buttons, uh, but it's, it's pretty much up in the open, right, how, how that works. So providing good conceptual models is a principle of good design. It allows you to, it allows the designer um, to put an image into the user's head that lets the user predict what's going to happen if they do a certain action. Right? If I you know, do this on this device, that's going to happen. This is a good conceptual model. Also, if I have, as a user, a good conceptual model of how a device works, it actually helps me deal with problems. Right? If something goes wrong and I have a good conceptual model, that helps me fix it. Um, so conceptual models are essentially mental models of, of things, right? how they work. Uh, we have lots of mental models. Right? You have mental models of everything, of yourself. You have a mental model of other people around you. You have a mental model of the environment as a whole. Uh, conceptual models are a special example of mental models uh, that are about the devices and things and objects that uh, you interact with. Um, how do they come about? Well. Um, Experience mostly, you, know, if you use an object a couple times, you build a conceptual model fairly quickly. Um, sometimes you need training to build a conceptual model or instruction, um, uh, but that's usually, you know, depends on what your situation is. So how does, you know, the internet work for your grandparents, right? Do they have the same view of, oh yeah, if I, you know, push a button here, then an event gets sent into uh, the operating system, and that gets distributed to the right application, and that starts the TCP IP connection to the server, and, and there's a bu bunch of packets going down, you know, that DSL line there. And No, probably not, right? They have a different model of how the internet works. It's their conceptual model of how it works, um, and it's created from their experience and whatever the system offered them as, as guidance with this. And that's why interfaces are so important, because the UI is the one thing that the user sees and interacts with. The, the, the user doesn't interact with you know, the black box behind it. He interacts with that UI. And the UI is there to create that conceptual model. So here's an image of that that's uh, from Norman's book. And I really like this image. It, I think it makes it quite clear what's going on. Um, here's you, the designer. You have a conceptual model in your head of, let's take as example, a, a file browser. right? So you have an idea of how a file browser is supposed to work. You think of files and folders, 
files are inside folders. Folders can also be inside other folders, which is moving away a little from the physical, uh, you know, uh, metaphor, but okay. Um, and and you yeah, and files have names and they have change dates and whatnot. Uh, and so this is your design model of how a file browser should work, right? And then maybe you say there's a trash can that I can put stuff in and I can pull it back out later without it being deleted and so on. So you now build a system uh, and the system has a system image, right? It has basically a user interface um, that the user encounters and interacts with. So this is what you craft. Behind, the, you know, behind it, it's all dirty you know, bits and bytes being written to you know, sectors on your hard disk or into your flash ROM, whatever. Uh, we don't care, but the user interface is these you know, little yellow manila folders that are happily sitting on the desktop next to each other. They have names and change dates displayed and so on. So now the user gets to interact with that, right? The user, you just wrote the Windows you know, file browser and the user now starts up their Windows session, they start working with this thing. So they build up a mental model in their head, right? A conceptual model of how files and folders and how all this works in Windows. Um, by interacting with the system, by seeing the system image, by seeing your UI for that. And they see the trash can and they're like, oh cool, it's a trash can, I can put stuff in there. Oh, and look at that, I can open it up and uh, stuff is still there, that's really cool. Um, so they've built up a mental model that seems to match your mental model, right? Um, but uh, problems arise if you're, if you're not consistent with that. Um, because when the designer's conceptual model is different from what actually emerges as the user's mental model, you run into issues. Let me give you an example for that. Um, in many versions of Windows, you could put files into the trash can and you could put them back out, pull them back out again, just like a real you know, paper waste basket. But if you threw a whole folder of files into the waste basket, anybody know what happened? This is going back way in early versions of Windows, so probably you didn't have to deal with this. It actually took all the files out of all the folders and flattened the file hierarchy. So your folder hierarchy was destroyed, uh, which is not a big deal if you throw in one folder with 15 files in it. They would all be on the root level now, okay, you can kind of deal with that. But imagine you put in you know, like you know, five years of, 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 of papers in there, and each of them has the same substructure, right? They would all end up at the same level, and then Windows would do its weird, like squiggly tilde renaming thing to get rid of name duplicates, etc. Um, so, what ha was going on there was that the uh, trash can in early versions of Windows was not implemented. This was all the way up to Windows XP. Uh, was not implemented well. It was actually working in a way that it was not allowing you uh, to put a folder in and pull it back out. When you f put a folder in, it was flattened. So, what do you think happened now? What do you think people did in response to that? Yeah. They created their own folder called trash. Yeah, exactly. You know, they created a folder called, you know, stuff I would put in the trash can, but I don't really trust it, so I'm going to put it here, right? So stuff, right, or trash, my, my own trash folder, because I know that works, right? I can put stuff in there, and then, so essentially the trash can broke, right? For these people, the metaphor of the trash can that had, that the designer had intended to build up in the user's head just fell apart. Right? It, it, and then once you've moved that way, you're not really going to trust the, you know, trust the trash can anyway. Um, so be aware that you actually have a certain responsibility when you design an interface. Your design is responsible for the mental model, the conceptual model that emerges in the user's head when they interact with your stuff. And that model should be so that these users can feel competent, that they don't make unnecessary mistakes with the system uh, and that they can get their task done and that they maybe enjoy the thing as they do that, right? That's your responsibility. Or to, you know, how a, 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 a guy, a designer, I think it was at, at Apple years ago, a UI designer, put it this way, and I, I put a magician's picture here to give you guys some pride in your, in your profession. Interface design, he said, is all about crafting the user illusion, right? So in the end, that whole, you know, these happy little yellow folders, they don't exist, you know. Sad news, maybe for some, but you all know this, right? It's all bits and bytes and, and ugly, you know, whatever uh, method calls and stuff going on in the operating system behind the scenes. But to the user, these yellow files and fo these yellow folders exist, right? And they are an illusion, but you need to make sure that you craft this illusion without any holes in it, right? Without breaking it. In the case of the trash can, 
um, the illusion of it being a trash can that you could trust putting stuff into broke because of one mistake, one shortcut they took in development and said, oh, people are never going to put entire folder hierarchies in there. It's not a big deal. Or we don't know how to deal with this right now. So, um, you know, if the, however, if that model breaks down in one step, users are not going to say, oh, it's a trash can. I totally trust it, except it has this one issue with folder hierarchies. Right? They're going to build a new mental model, and that model might probably say, like you said, I'm not going to use that trash can anymore. I'm not sure what, you know, it's doing weird stuff to my files. Um, so be aware of this. You're magicians, right? That's what I'm saying here. You're crafting a user illusion. Uh, and you can do this fun, you know, cool hand movements if you want to. Uh, but either way, you are responsible for what users encounter and how they think about the system. So let's get back to the remote control that you guys designed in the beginning of the class. Just take a look at it maybe for a minute or two. Talk to your partner. Uh, and figure out if there's anything with what you've learned now that you might be doing differently in your remote control design, okay? Just take a minute or two. So, uh, just to wrap this up, let's, uh, let's maybe hear. Did anybody, I mean, some things you may have done that, that could remain the same, right? I'm not saying everything you designed was uh, necessarily wrong, but maybe you found a point or two where you said, okay, I'm going to change this around. Does anybody have an example of what they were able to improve about their uh, design based on what we did here today. Anything you want to share? Yeah, go ahead. Ah, okay. So law of proximity at work to to group relation uh, related functions together. Yeah, that's a that's a really uh, frequent one um, where we discover that okay, we can do that. It's not expensive either, right? You just shift things around a bit. You don't need to introduce completely new functionality. Yeah. So we didn't really know how to change it, but we realized that some devices need buttons that other devices don't need. But uh -huh. you have a button, and uh, you don't know if it belongs to a device or not, so that you have a problem. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, Th that's a big challenge, right? You might have a record button, but that doesn't make sense on the TV, let's say, but it does make sense on your VCR or something. Uh, and then what to do with it, how you can't really make it go away, right, and uh, immediately. Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, and that's where, by the way, this is where, of course, uh, software-based user interface, touch-based user interfaces, of course, are really good because then you can literally remove that button from the UI. That was one of the key ingenious things that, you know, the iPhone made possible to have a touchscreen interface where I could just optimize the UI for the task at hand uh, and it could just morph into whatever you needed. Uh, but it reduces consistency, of course, yeah, and then the button isn't always there, and maybe you're wondering why it's gone all of a sudden. Yeah, um, back there. Ah. Yeah, nice. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good example. Um, like, Another super great indicator of a bad user interface, to my mind, is if it has a mode switch, like a mode button, that's already asking for problems, right? We're going to get to that later on, but mode buttons that let you like cycle through modes are usually not ideal because you can't immediately pick one that you want to. You need to step through it. Um, and yeah, I like your idea, like having, having some kind of indicator where we are. Or you, maybe there could be a light over the button if you wanted to do it, say like this one is currently active. Um, but you got to make sure that it's easy to interpret. Okay, um, wrapping this up as the bell is tolling here. Um, what to do now? You need to read Norman's book, right? So get the book if you don't have it already uh, and go until page 36 at least this week. Uh, you are welcome to go further than that. Uh, you've got four weeks total to finish the book, so we're moving fast on this one. As of this moment, we're already 12% into the book. We also have a recommended reading here. Um, that is the Human-Computer Interaction Chapter 3 on Interaction and Schneiderman's Chapter on Theories. You will find these on Moodle, okay? Uh, the Norman book is not on Moodle. We have chapter excerpts on Moodle for you guys to access. Thank you very much. That's it. This content was provided by RWTH, Aachen University.